Has your way of working changed since you started out, or is it actually quite similar? No, I think it's basically the same. It's, it's sheer panic, and then at a certain point somebody says, you now have to actually deliver something, and you do your very best and somehow deliver it. The outsiders ravage our lands in front of our eyes. When you uh, set about the remake of June, you went away into the desert. Tell me, yes, I did. did you actually, what did you, for a week? I mean, did you actually go into a tent, lie down and close your eyes? It wasn't quite, I guess, it was a little bit, bit more, it, it was, oh, well, it was a then. lot more like, serious than that. I, I felt part of my job was to go and, and just listen to nothing, listen to the desert, listen to what it's like out there. Um, it's not method composing, but it's, um, it, it, the, 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 I, I know there was something glorious that I was missing had I not done it. There's just no time to die. A different scenario was your late arrival at No Time to Die. The reason, though, that it was doubly important was because it was you know, the idea that this film would re-energise cinema. That this was the film post-pandemic that people were going to come back and see on the big screen. And no, I thought it was like I was going to go and kill Bond, and I was people were going to go and burn my house down. But yes, I, I agree with you. It, it, and, and I think it did. Mm -hmm. I think I think if one film could do it, it would be something that had a reckless character like Bond and let us all be a little bit reckless, and let us all be a little bit free and go mm -hmm. and get back into the cinema. Tell me I love you, Dad. Let's move now to another passion, and perhaps a greater passion, which is for you the environment. I think the only work that I've done that's worth anything is working on, you know, working for, for Sir David Attenborough. Uh, it's like I had found my calling. I had found the thing that I was really set on this planet to do. Because what I think he does so brilliantly is he doesn't control, he doesn't preach, mm. he doesn't bully you into doing something about the planet. He does one very simple thing which I can help him with. He makes you fall in love with this planet that we are part of. And if we don't, if we aren't mindful, and remember, I've done the other side. I've done Interstellar, which is all about this planet is doomed and we better yeah. leave. I don't want to leave. I like it here, mm -hmm. you know, and I like the creatures around me. You're going to be doing another tour. Presumably the musicians you have are from all over the world. And I wonder what you think about the power of music for peace. Interesting question, because I realized I have so many refugees in my band. I mean, when we started the last tour, we had booked the orchestra three years before, and then COVID, of course, stopped us. And the orchestra was from Odessa, from Ukraine. And we managed to get 10 people out. We didn't get the whole orchestra out, because right as we started rehearsal, the war started. This is an extermination. They're picking my family off one by one. When music is such an integral part of a film, it sets the mood, it sets the atmosphere, but does a little bit of you die when you see someone watching that film on their iPhone or on a laptop? Well, let me be very candid. When we were doing Dune and we were in the middle of writing, they were filming and, and, and this beautiful thing, IMAX and everything, and super duper surround and, and, and full frequency range. And then we get this message that, oh no, we're going to start streaming it on the same day as you're going to come out in cinemas. And I just went, yeah. you don't understand. Because had you said to me, we're going to be streaming this right from the word go, I would have written quite a different score. Because to this day, I still get letters from people going, there's 20 seconds of music missing in the dark night. I'm going, no, there is not any music missing. You're listening to it on your phone and the frequency is too low. I, I, I can adapt. 
but I don't want to adapt. I got into film partly because I went to see Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time mm -hmm. in the West on a big screen, and it was fabulous, and it was an experience. And please, I don't know anybody who's had an experience watching their, that film on their iPhone. Mm -hmm. The problem is the streamers have the money, the ones the streamers are making films, the streamers say it's going to get a cinema release, a cinema release is five minutes, and then it goes. But what you're saying is you would never really truly want to adapt anything you're doing if you knew it was just coming out in an iPhone. No, I can, I can, and, 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 and I would, because, you know, look, at the end of the day, we're making a recording, it's not a live performance you're watching, it's a recording you're hearing, and it's all down to one simple thing. If I write a good tune, it doesn't matter if you're listening to it on your, I don't know, on your iPhone or, you know, on the greatest stereo system in the world. If it's a decent tune, it'll move you. You've also taken a grip of franchise. You didn't do Top Gun, you did Top Gun Maverick. How did it feel looking back at Top Gun and thinking what you were going to do with it? So there came the opportunity to go and, and, and work with Lady Gaga and I thought rather than just taking her song and sticking it in, it'd be really great if, if we could develop it and, and actually make it into the love theme and just really collaborate. <laughs> I can just say this about myself. I am completely and utterly unemployable. You wouldn't want me. But put me on the stage, or put me in front of a film, and give me the freedom, give me enough rope, mm -hmm. and I'll be all right.